open groups across the, the six assessment report. The second part of what I wanted to talk about was how I personally uh, engage with stakeholders uh, in explaining the science and helping people to understand what the problem is uh, and that they need to be part of the solution as well. So uh, obviously part of my role as an IPCC scientist is contributing to these reports which directly inform the negotiations here and other COPs so many IPCC authors are part of the mandated sessions here where being working directly and being questioned by government delegations on the details of the science so there's direct engagement between IPCC scientists and governments here at COP. Um, I also work directly with the UK government um, in the Met Office so we work with Bayes at the Department for Bene Business Energy and Industrial Strategy who hold the climate uh, portfolio and the Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, which look after climate adaptation. So I work directly with those. So I do a lot with uh, policymakers, but I also do a lot with other groups uh, as well. So I do uh, many interviews on the on the mainstream media. For example, I'm frequently called upon to uh, explain the climate connection. Like in the summer in the UK, we had the hottest temperatures on record. We had 40 degrees Celsius for the first time ever in the UK on the 19th of July. And I did a lot of interviews on the BBC uh, making clear that that was in part due to climate change. It would not have happened without climate change. Uh, so that's part of my engagement activity. I also work in social media a lot. Uh, I'm very active on Twitter, uh, less active on Facebook and uh, Instagram and other platforms, but mainly on Twitter. Uh, and I find that quite useful to engage with uh, a whole range of people, not just scientists, uh, but also uh, people in civil society, and NGOs, concerned citizens uh, who often want to know, is there still hope? Can we still solve uh, the climate change issue? So I have a lot of discussions on social media uh, in that way. I also do a lot of public talks, which I really enjoy talking to, uh, say, school groups, business groups, uh, local communities, uh, and so on. I also... Uh, uh, speak at uh, festivals, uh, there's a, a, a music and science festival at the Jodrell Bank Observatory and Astro Astronomy uh, Centre in the UK, which has a science festival, I, I speak at that. But I also speak, perhaps more unusually, at music festivals like the Glastonbury Festival. I've been there for the last three years. Uh, most recently, we actually had a science area within Glastonbury where lots of scientists, lots of science, science organisations had stalls uh, with science outreach activities. And we had our own little stage where we had uh, science-based uh, acts, so people performing music, poetry, uh, and comedy on a science theme, or people who, in their day job, were scientists who were performing music and so on. Uh, so that was another way of engaging with a different audience. And we find, actually, that's quite good for getting to a whole a very different uh, set of the population. People who come to a public talk on climate change are already concerned. But say if you're at the Glastonbury Festival, you can just catch passers-by who are on their way to watch, watch a band or something. And the stalls that are very good at public engagement, they'll have activities which will draw people in uh, and engage them and start a conversation about science. Uh, not just climate science, but any, any kind of science. Uh, the other... Th uh, the other area I wanted to talk about was that other, other scientists are getting uh, also engaging more in the arts. Uh, so working with, directly with musicians and uh, poets and, and bands uh, and, and so on. And uh, uh, the, there's been a great performance. Some of my colleagues from the University of Exeter uh, had a performance uh, in Cairo last week uh, in Tahrir Square, which was performed both in English and Arabic which was telling some stories, but some very personal stories about people being impacted by climate change. And these are, these are not climate science colleagues of mine, they're from uh, arts departments within the university, so a whole different area of academia uh, engaging with the public. And they brought that here to COP27. It's being performed in the Green Zone tomorrow uh, at f uh, late in the day, I think about 6 o'clock, maybe it's 4 o'clock. But anyway, this performance... Bringing together arts and science is really important. And I think all this is a really great, really important way of engaging with the public. It's people often don't respond to facts, they respond to emotions. So if you can touch people in some other ways, put, touch them emotionally, to, uh, get their feelings engaged, uh, that's a really good way of really getting to the heart of it and promoting more action on climate change, which, which is what uh, urgently needed. I'll finish there. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, thank you very much, Richard. Uh, that was very, very interesting. Um,
if I might just ask a question about, about, uh, about your work. Um, clearly, the IPCC reports and scientists like yourselves are doing a great job to raise awareness globally uh, about climate change and the, cl the causes of climate change. Uh, but to what extent do you think that raising awareness is translating into uh, concrete action uh, by people, by governments? And to what extent is, do you think your reports and your scientific work is actually uh, uh, prescribing or leading to clearer ideas as to the solutions themselves? I, th I think it, it, it does make a difference through a variety of routes. So, for example, the IPCC report on global warming of 1.5 degrees, which came out in 2018, that was obviously most directly aimed at policymakers, and it did inform the UN process and other governments. And actually, some governments increased their ambition directly as a result of that. The UK government, for example, increased its ambition to... Uh, from reducing emissions to 80% uh, down to net zero by the mid-century. Mid so the UK government directly responded to the IPCC report. But also it informs, I think it does help in other ways. So the Fridays for Future movement, uh, Greta Thunberg's movement started in directly after this IPCC 1.5 degree report. It was a real, it was the, probably the most widely read scientific report, I think. So Fridays for Future started, other... Uh, groups in civil society, Ex Extinction Rebellion, for example, already existed, but they upped their messaging in response to the IPCC report. But David Attenborough is quoting it on the BBC, so it raised a lot more awareness, and that then gives policymakers the mandate uh, to be more ambitious if they can see that public are calling for it. Th those are really great examples of how science and data can, can drive action. Do, do, do one of our other panelists want to ask uh, Richard a question? Kirsty? Thanks, Richard. Um, I think it's so important the work you're doing, and thank you for you know obviously all the extracurricular work that you do to communicate about the importance of climate. Um, we're here in the Atoms for Climate Pavilion. I think it's the first time that the IAEA has had a pavilion here at the COP, and you know over the last several years, I've really seen an increasing sort of recognition and call to action for nuclear energy to be included in the discourse about action on climate change. And I'm really interested in your perspective on that, if you're seeing that as well, and if you also are making the case uh, when you're talking about the solutions that are available to us. So yes, I, 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 am, I am seeing that uh, happening. It's been talked about a lot more, as you say. Uh, personally speaking, uh, I think we need to throw everything at this problem. I don't like to rule anything out. Um, I am actually a, a big fan of James Lovelock, who thought of the guy hypothesis. He's a good, good friend of mine, the late, dear departed Jim. I did a lot of work with him, um, helped him with some of his earlier books. He was actually one of the sort of first sort of environmental scientists to turn around and say, actually, uh, we do need nuclear. He's, he's, he was quite radical in his time, and it, he alienated a lot of uh, sort of traditional Greens in that way. And he made a lot of us think, actually, perhaps we do need to rethink uh, on this. So personally, I think we need everything on the table at this point. Yeah. Th thank you. Thank you, Professor Betts. Um, any other questions uh, for, for him? OK. Uh, so, so now we'll introduce our second speaker. Um, Marie, Marie Song, uh, 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 Patricia Makututsa, uh, comes from Lesotho, as I said earlier. She's a statistician. She is deputy president of the African Young Generation in Nuclear, uh, and, uh, and she's an energy planner. So, Marie Song, it's over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeff. So, let me maybe just start saying this is, this is a youth day, and I would like to say happy youth day to all the youth out here in the pavilion and uh, globally. So, uh, as Jeff has already mentioned, I, I come from the statistics background, and uh, all the time, you know, you can't say no to facts. Data says a lot. So, uh, I am also the national license assistant in the Ministry of Energy and Meteorology. And I would say for, for this topic of today, we are saying clean energy. And then for, for, for us to counter the effects of climate change, we, it's the global mandate. We are saying we're transitioning from fossil fuels to using clean energy. 
In Lesotho, where I come from, we are 100% renewable in terms of production, but uh, that, is, that doesn't suffice to meet all the demand of the country. So we also import from South Africa, and South Africa produces uh, from coal and uh, nuclear, of course. They are the first ones to have the nuclear reactor in the African continent. So we, we, we are saying, as, in as much as Lesotho uh, has seen and has been using clean energy from the very first start, and even the future plants are saying clean energy, but then we are already seeing a shortfall in clean energies, in the renewable energies, because that's the only source of energy that we are using. They are short. The, we can, the, the current uh, production cannot meet the demand that we have. So we are already importing and we are importing unclean energy. We don't have a voice to what kind of, what source of energy should be used by the countries that we import from. So in order for us to really fight climate change and uh, contribute to the global call to fight climate change, I think we need to have a mix that is reliable, that is sustainable, and that would mean bringing in nuclear into the energy mix. So far, there are no plans in Sesotho, and uh, I think that is the main idea behind us forming the national chapter for African, for Lesotho Young Generation in Nuclear, to say that we want to really now go out into the streets, of course, uh, into schools. We can start from the grassroots and teach the children now that there is this new technology that has, is packed with so many opportunities that can talk to economy, that can talk to clean energy transition, and then they will take it up as they grow. And uh, you know, when you start from very small mines, they, they grow up with that and it never goes out. And we will take it also to the streets and talk to the general public. And uh, hopefully the, 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 the perception, the wrong perceptions about nuclear will be changed in the, in the meantime. We're also saying as young, as youth, we should also knock on the doors of the policymakers and uh, unpack the facts around nuclear. And of course use data because uh, you know I'm from the <laughs> statistics background so data you should show facts and uh, that is the only way you're gonna convince the policymakers that this is this some, this is something that can really work so we will knock in the bottoms and uh, have our voice and uh, this is something that we have already started uh, as African young generation in clear we just uh, reviewed our strategic plan this year and in in the strategic plan we say like we are already saying start from the grassroots go to schools primary schools teach the children and then we'll take it from there and have a national from schools to national comp competitions where we will buy will be raising awareness about clean energy and all the other the important sources that contribute to clean energy. Renewable, we, we are not taking out renewables, of course, because they are part of the solution. But we're saying also bring nuclear into the picture because it really is much more, provides much more sustainable solutions and reliable solutions to the, to the clean energy transition. So in terms of, of advocacy, we are also affiliated with the international uh, IYNC, International Youth uh, Nuclear Congress. And we have an annual summit whereby we conference is a congress. It's a conference whereby we meet as a youth and we share research and uh, experiences from uh, different countries. So we, will, we as AYGN, we also have a biannual summit where we also call and promote research so that uh, we have a concrete uh, Information when we go to all these stakeholders, different stakeholders to promote nuclear, we have uh, informed uh, research and informed uh, uh, data. So we are taking it to a lower level and saying from IYNC to, to AYGN and down to the countries, we should all also have such uh, similar summits. We will take it from the schools, like I already mentioned and uh, then we have national competitions and uh, we will have our youth participating in that. Uh, I think also from the perspective of um, 
advocacy and communication. I think first it's important to capacitate the youth. You cannot uh, give out what you don't have. So let's first have the skills, get this, the, the youth to be capacitated in nuclear science and technology and all the clean energy technologies that are here to, to bring solutions to countering climate change. And then from there you know you, are, you have the confidence that if they are going out to advocate for these clean energy solutions, they are going to pass out the right message. So for me, I think that is it. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Marie Song. That's, that's very interesting. I, I didn't know that people in Lesotho were thinking about uh, nuclear power as, a, as part of the mix. Um, I know that the, um, there are many countries in Africa looking at nuclear. The IAEA works with, with many of them uh, in, helping to, uh, in helping to support their efforts to in, uh, establish the, the infrastructure for a nuclear power program. Um, but let me ask you, when you're, when you're talking with and communicating with youth, with um, even younger kids, um, how, how do you explain to them that uh, perhaps a system just with 100% renewables um, can't really fulfill the full needs of a country? And, and how, do you, how do you illustrate the role that nuclear in that mix can play uh, for them in a way that they can understand and, and sort of take it forward? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank, but let me first say, we, the country has not yet, as yet pronounced itself in terms of having nuclear power. So that's why we, I said we, we established the national chapter for YGN so that we promote nuclear power, <laughs> nuclear opportunities around nuclear energy. And coming to the question, I think the, the youth can already see we are currently in Lesotho rolling out the, what we call the electrification master plan, and uh, it promotes uh, what we call off-grid mini-crits for all these uh, rural areas that uh, cannot tap from the main grid. And uh, the tariff for mini-crits is a bit higher than what, what uh, the people in the urban areas are getting through, min through the main grid. And this itself is posing a problem because we are saying them, these marginalized people who cannot afford, they are getting power at a very high price as compared to those people that we're saying they, are, they have access to jobs and they can afford. So that itself is saying there is a problem in the system. Yeah, so. Do we, ha do we have any other questions for Mari Song? No? Okay. Thank you very much. Then uh, at this point, we're going to turn to our last speaker, Kirsty Gogan, who's uh, uh, quite well known in the clean energy uh, world. Uh, she's sort of a crusading campaigner to, uh, to, uh, to uh, solve the, energy, the climate change uh, challenge that we're facing. Um, I, will, uh, I will leave it to you to, to maybe introduce yourself a little bit more and, and, uh, and tell us your story. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff, and thanks for inviting me to contribute alongside these great you know, speakers. It's an honor to be here. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Kirsty Gogan, I'm the co-founder um, of Terra Praxis, which is a nonprofit developing uh, really scalable solutions for some of our toughest to decarbonize uh, parts of the economy. Um, and actually, it's great that Richard really set the scene because you know, we, we, we're facing a pretty bad situation. We have 27 years to decarbonize the entire global energy infrastructure, but then also probably double or even triple it to meet the kind of rising energy demand that's necessary to bring everybody's standards of living um, up to, uh, to have a good quality of life, but also to establish resilience to the climate impacts that we're already experiencing and will continue to experience. So, you know, those are the kind of core principles for, for us. It's really about decarbonization and increased energy access. Um, and today I'm going to talk to you about um, uh, the kind of organizing principles for us and in, in how we communicate about the role that nuclear technology can play in contributing to these big challenges with a focus on uh, two of the big unsolved sources of carbon emissions, coal and liquid fuels. Now, I'm sure you guys already know that coal contributes almost a third of our total global carbon emissions. And uh, despite the pledges that were made at uh, COP26 to phase down coal or phase out coal or whatever it was, coal has since been booming. 
um, and broken records last year and is expected to break records again this year globally around the world. And there's a reason for that. It's because we need the energy. Um, so, you know, I'm going to tell you about some strategies that we're developing to uh, get rid of the emissions, but to continue supply, supplying clean, reliable energy to communities that need it. Um, and uh, that's really around the sort of the organizing principle of values alignment. And then secondly, liquid fuels. We use 100 million barrels of oil per day right now. Okay, that's keeping the whole global economy moving. Um, and we need to replace it somehow. Um, 27 years, people, to 2050. So those, those are the strategies that we're developing to solve. Um, so the two kind of organizing principles that I'm going to talk about are, firstly, values-based alignment as a kind of organizing principle for communications. And secondly, being really rigorous about the science around risk communication. So what do I mean, firstly, by values-based alignment? So actually, you, Richard, you gave a great example when you talked about the way that you know, James Lovelock, who is you know, a, an inspiring leader, that you, you know, really respected, um, you know, said something kind of shocking to you that seemed to be like contradicting, you know, the sort of larger, you know, uh, cultural identity that he would otherwise be, you know, part of as a sort of, you know, environmental leader. He said, by the way, guys, we need nuclear energy. And, um, you know, so values-based alignment really is around the idea that the messenger is as important as the message. Now, the message is important too, which I'll talk about. Another example is actually from COP21, which was my first COP, uh, when I brought four of the world's uh, leading climate scientists, including James Hansen and Ken Caldera, um, to, uh, to make a statement about the need for nuclear energy as a climate solution alongside uh, renewables and our other clean energy sources. And that, you know, created a sort of lot of cognitive dissonance for the climate movement at the time because James Hansen in particular was seen as like this godfather of climate change, a real leader, and to have him say something which was contradicting the worldview within that, uh, within that uh, culture was, was very shocking. But it forces people to sort of reconsider um, their position. And I think that's, that was the beginning um, of a big change, um, also really importantly contributed to by the, the nuclear for climate movement that continues to this day that we're, you know, really sort of shining a light on the contribution that nuclear is already making to uh, our global clean energy system. Um, you know, what does success look like from a climate perspective? Well, it starts with a clean electricity grid and the countries around the world who've achieved that there's only a small number of modern industrialized economies that already have achieved success from a climate perspective um, in their electricity grids. Uh, you know, two of them have uh, fortunate um, natural resources. So Norway has hydro and Iceland has geothermal and hydro. But the others, Sweden and Switzerland and France and Brazil, have achieved a clean electricity grid through a combination of nuclear and renewables. And so that was the beginning of you know, the sort of values-based alignment story that I think we started to tell as a community. And I have to congratulate the IAEA for like, being here with a pavilion this year. It's, it's fantastic. It's awesome. So you know, I think we're really starting to, uh, to sort of uh, you know, evolve our communications in a, in a positive way. OK, so I'm going to talk now about, um, about the liquid fuels challenge. Um, my, my business partner, Eric Ingersoll, and I um, uh, together wrote a report called The Missing Link to a Livable Climate, which we published back in September uh, 2020. Um, and this re report was really um, about the uh, value of nuclear energy for producing hydrogen-based synthetic fuels. Now, these synthetic fuels could potentially, if they're produced at a low enough cost and a large enough scale, really start to make a dent in those 100 million barrels of oil that we currently use today to enable continued uh, storage, distribution, transport, and end-use infrastructure to continue operating, keep the global economy moving, but without the emissions. And we were sending this draft report around to various you know, eminent and distinguished people to peer review, and we kept getting the same comments back. Wait a second, nuclear energy is too expensive, and nuclear energy is too complicated, and nuclear energy takes too long to build. And we were saying, wait, what? But 
the way that we're proposing to deliver and deploy these nuclear technologies addresses all those issues. But what we found was that there was a lot of preconceived ideas around the word that were kind of embedded in the word nuclear, expensive and risky and slow. And so we thought, okay, well, that's, we really are like not able to get the point across that we're trying to make here, that if you deliver nuclear energy as a manufactured-based product, which is made in a factory or made in a world-class shipyard, then you can achieve very low costs, very high rates of deployment, very large-scale deployment, and therefore get down to those $1 a kilogram levels that you need for hydrogen production to be a useful ingredient in clean synthetic fuels. If you can do that, then this technology is really useful. But everybody's missing that story because there's a sort of preconceived idea when they encounter the word nuclear of an experience which is, you know, from the recent experience of building large nuclear plants in the United States and Europe. So we, start, we stopped using the word. And uh, we started saying advanced heat sources instead. Because actually what we wanted to do was to shine a light on the attributes of the technology, which is that the technology can produce power and heat. And the heat, by the way, is really useful for increasing the efficiency, lowering the cost, and increasing the volume of the hydrogen production. So that's great. So power plus heat, awesome. High capacity factor, so you know, operating for like 90% or more of the time, which means that any other capital investment that you make in your associated infrastructure, like the electrolyzers, for example, you know, you start to get great value out of that investment, which lowers your costs further. So power, heat, high capacity factor, and then the last one is a really small environmental footprint. And that's really, really valuable because it means that you're not competing with wind and solar for space but actually you could deploy this stuff to many, many locations without the requirement for good wind and solar resources or vast amounts of land. So those were the attributes that we, we really wanted to shine a light on. And those are the values, the value proposition that nuclear technology was bringing to the table. So um, that, you know, we published the report and, uh, uh, you know, it's been quite impactful, I think, as part of the kind of you know, literature that has been published since then about the contribution that, uh, that nuclear technologies can make and the recognition that didn't exist before that, frankly, about nuclear for hydrogen production in the larger climate discourse. And we're now, you know, being approached and working with all of the major oil producers and users. Because before this, they were facing a choice between extinction or business as usual. And neither of those choices are great choices for these oil producers. And so the idea that there could be a path for these oil companies to become suppliers of emissions-free clean synthetic fuels at scale and leveraging their existing global capabilities and skills and infrastructure and storage and distribution and end use customers, you know, why wouldn't we do that? Why wouldn't we enable those massive companies already operating at global scale to transition their operations to emissions-free alternatives in a way that it doesn't require people to pay more, fly less, um, or change their behavior? Because all of those alternative strategies create risk that we will fail to address this existential risk that we face to humanity on this planet. We have 27 years, so we absolutely must repurpose as much existing infrastructure as possible and leverage the existing global capabilities as much as possible. And I'll tell one more quick story before I close. I'm the, keep looking at Jeff in case I'm running over time here. Um, so the next story is about coal. Now, I already mentioned you know, almost a third of global carbon emissions and you know, we're really not shutting down those plants. And the reason for that is they're not just you know, isolated emitters of carbon emissions that we can just sort of switch off without any consequences. They're, uh, they're plants that sit in complex social, political, and economic ecosystems providing energy that's really needed by the people that use it. And the utilities need to find a way of replacing somehow that energy without emissions. And the alternatives that they're looking at are, you know, 
very impractical, frankly. Um, so what we're looking at is developing a system to essentially replace the coal boiler with a new heat source, which matches the uh, footprint, the performance, the cost, and the capacity factor of the existing plant, enabling the workforce to continue w operating those plants and the energy to continue being supplied to those consumers. Um, because there's, otherwise we're going to face massive opposition to these plants being shut down. Even in countries with old coal, like the United States and Europe and Canada, we see opposition to these coal plants being shut down because it's a devastating prospect for the communities, uh, the loss of jobs, the loss of socioeconomic benefits and tax revenues in those communities is devastating. So figuring out a way to go with the grain of the reality of the situation um, is absolutely key. And, you know, this idea to deploy SMRs in a factory-based, product-based, low-cost, low fast and repeatable method has started to attract the interest of massive global sustainability leaders. Now, our organization is tiny. <laughs> We're funded by philanthropy. It's really hard to raise money for, uh, for uh, climate-based work that includes anything to do with nuclear energy. The foundations are way behind on this, and they need to get better. Um, despite how small we are, and despite our very small team and our very limited resources, we somehow managed to attract the attention of massive global sustainability leaders like Microsoft. Uh, some of you will have heard of this company, I'm sure, and uh, Schneider Electric. And the reason that they're interested in this is because they recognize that if we're successful, this could be the largest carbon reduction opportunity on the planet. And it gives them an opportunity to leverage and apply their incredible digital capability uh, to, to solve one of these biggest problems. So they're working with us to develop a platform that can enable coal plant owners to step through the whole development process in a way that is radically cheaper and faster than if they were to try to do it in the conventional way. And the fun, interesting thing about that is that all of a sudden, nuclear energy stops being like a thing associated with something of the past and a big cumbersome old, you know, uh, complicated, you know, cathedral inside a cathedral and starts being something connected to digital, AI, you know, um, design, automation, and stuff that's really cool and interesting that lots of people want to participate in. So all of a sudden we're in the tech space, we're not anymore in the old-fashioned infrastructure space. And so from a communications point of view, that is enabling us to have really different kinds of conversations about the role of nuclear technologies to address our biggest decarbonization challenges. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Kirsty. Uh, as usual, you have a lot going on and it's very fascinating. Um, you know, listening to you, it sounds like, um, it sounds like nuclear is almost entering a new, a new phase of, of, of development. Um, and it's not just you, I mean, w we had here yesterday uh, an event with DG Grossi where he interviewed Fatih Birol, uh, the, the head of the International Energy Agency. Uh, I don't know if my microphone is working. But, uh, and Fatih Birol said at the beginning of the event, nuclear uh, is in a strong comeback. And of course, he's not just saying that. We, anybody who reads the newspapers or watches TV has seen over the last few weeks, the last few months, uh, many, many countries stepping forward and renewing their interest uh, announcing new projects uh, and basically uh, sh showing themselves ready to, to, to take interest, if not take action, in, in, um, in uh, looking at or deploying nuclear power. So I guess my question for you is, uh, <clears throat> we seem to be at a, at a, at a tipping point here uh, with nuclear, but to bring it back to the subject of this conversation, communications, stakeholder engagement, uh, despite all this good news, there's still work to be done, evidently. What do you think is the one of one of a couple of uh, you know ma the main challenge or the missing link? What's the next level that we have to get to in terms of of, of that engagement and that communication to really get this over the finish line? Um, yeah. So actually, thanks for the chance to say one more thing because I for I forgot to say something that answers this question, which is around risk communication. So. 
Um, you know, one of the issues we face with, you know, bringing nuclear into this conversation is people are, uh, you know, perceive risks associated with it. And the science of risk communication tells us that, you know, actually we do risky behavior all the time, right? But we do it if we perceive that there's ben the benefits outweigh the risks. So we get in airplanes, we drive around in cars, we drink alcohol, you know, we do all, ki we do all kinds of risky behavior and we are constantly taking risks when we think that the benefits outweigh the risks. Now, one of the things I think that we need to get better at is rather than offering nuclear technology in the abstract, we need to really be defining very targeted applications for nuclear technology that are solving big decarbonization challenges and energy access challenges that are not already being solved as elsewhere. And I'm really you know, happy to see in this pavilion, for example, lots of examples of this, where we're seeing you know, nuclear technology can, can, can complement wind and solar in a future electricity grid by offering firm dispatchable power to support uh, renewables, but it can also produce heat. And decarbonizing heat is one of our biggest challenges that we can't easily solve with wind and solar. We can't electrify heavy transport like marine and like shipping and aviation, and we can't easily electrify industrial heat to produce steel and chemicals and glass and concrete. So I think one of the big challenges we have is, is, is really defining uh, the cost and performance requirements for, for the technologies to meet and design for that to address those issues. But the second big challenge that we have is absolutely, Jeff, you know what, there is this like clamor now for nuclear. With the Russian invasion of Ukraine, we've seen you know, many countries in Europe uh, reach 80% you know, or more public support for nuclear energy in Poland, in Sweden, in Finland, uh, all over Europe. We're seeing you know, a demand for nuclear, and the politicians don't know how to respond to that demand quickly enough. The real challenge that I think the industry faces right now is how can we deliver fast enough, at low enough costs, and at a large enough scale to meet the, to meet the demand for this technology um, to address our energy security as well as our environmental and affordability needs. Great. Th th thank you very much, Christy. So uh, we're, we're getting towards the end of our event. Uh, before we conclude, I'd like to just maybe uh, invite each of the speakers to make a brief, uh, brief concluding remark. Um, uh, <laughs> um, a, a brief concluding remark, and, and, then, uh, and then maybe uh, we'll... Uh, We'll wrap up for today. So back to you, Professor, Professor Rich, Richard Betts. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Uh, so well, actually, I, if I may, I wanted to ask Kirsty a question, which will lead into my concluding remark, because the, the uh, well, I'll start with my concluding remark, which is really important to engage with people and listen to their concerns and, and have a two-way discussion uh, with any kind of science. If you, you don't just want to impart your knowledge, you want to hear what they already understand or misunderstand and what they're worried about and then respond to that so that's i think it's really important with engagement for all kinds of stakeholders my question to you is when that question you talked about risk a bit a very common question is with what to do with the waste and the long-term nature of that what is your response to that because you must get that question a lot <laughs> oh yeah thanks great question um so what about it was my answer. What about the waste? It's, it's, we're really good at managing it. It's never harmed anybody. We store it incredibly, you know, incredibly well. Um, and, you know, it sits there. And, you know, many countries now in the world are developing long-term repositories uh, to, for the long-term storage of, of the spent fuel. Um, it's actually very interesting that spent fuel declines in radioactivity. So it's one of the only examples of a uh, toxic, toxic waste stream that becomes less toxic over time. So, um, you know, I, I, really, I really think that this is an issue that's been really successfully overblown by um, anti-nuclear uh, groups. Um, and it's distracted us from the waste streams that we really should be worried about, like, you know, the air pollution from fossil fuels that's causing seven million premature deaths per year. And uh, that includes indoor air pollution, which mainly impacts women and children who are 
in living in households without access to electricity. And the women not only are spending up to 35 hours a week you know, collecting fuel, like wood and dung, to burn in their home, um, but then they're exposed to the you know, toxic smoke uh, when they burn it. Um, so those, that's the waste stream that I'm worried about and that I think we should be focused on addressing. Um, and uh, you know, count on the you know, continued, very highly regulated, very high quality, very high performance management of the spent fuel. And hopefully you know, one day we'll also start recycling it. Oh, well, I guess the other part of my concluding remarks is just to remind everyone of the urgency of the issue. Uh, climate change is, is it, it's still ongoing and we're not on track anywhere near to meet the Paris targets. Uh, so we need to be reducing emissions rapidly starting now, but we also need to be adapting uh, to the changes that are already uh, put in place. So we need urgent action on, on both of these things. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I think I would say global warming is really becoming a threat to the next generation, so we should really concert efforts and uh, advocate for an inclusive clean energy transition. Shouldn't leave other sources behind, so net zero really needs nuclear. Thank you very much. One thing that we can learn from the COVID pandemic is that we called it an emergency a global emergency and then we acted like it was an emergency and we brought the you know development timeline for the vaccine down from what would typically take 10 years to 10 months to bring that vaccine to market globally we call the climate emergency an emergency and we need to start acting like it great well Thank, I'd like to thank each and every one of our speakers today for an excellent conversation. Uh, we, we've heard about the, the, the climate science uh, underpinning the need for action from Professor Betts. We've heard about the rising need for energy and clean energy in many parts of the world, including Africa, from Marisong. And we've heard about the new and exciting ways that nuclear energy can be used for very specific purposes including to decarbonize industry uh, from, from, uh, from Kirsty. So I'd like to thank them all, and thank you all for coming here today. On behalf of the IEA, have a very nice day. Thank you.